Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by the Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia and dedicated to the proposition articulated by Walter Lippmann during World War II that a strong and balanced foreign policy is the necessary shield of our democratic republic. I'm Eric Edelman, a counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, a Bulwark contributor, and a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center. And I am rejoined uh, after a, a week off by my partner in crime, Elliot Cohen, back from travels in, in Europe. Elliot, uh, how, how did it go? How was the staff ride? So uh, this was terrific. So at uh, the School of Advanced International Studies, we've had a tradition now for over two decades of doing international staff rides. I'm glad to say that the practice has spread, uh, including to several that are, have been run by uh, our guests today. On this trip, we were doing the Cold War, and uh, so we were in Berlin and Prague primarily with a detour to the place that had been the headquarters for the group of Soviet forces of Germany. And I must say there were some chilling moments. We went to the Stasi prison in uh, Berlin, and it was such a vivid reminder, particularly when you, know, when you got all the details of how they did things, uh, of just how important the victory in the Cold War was. It's not something to be taken lightly. Not something to be taken lightly that the frontier of freedom moved a couple hundred miles east uh, and that the people who ended up being liberated benefited enormously. But we're not, probably not here to talk about that. We're probably here to talk to our friend Peter Fever, who is joining us again for the second time. Uh, I think he was last with us in October. He is a recidivist, therefore, and so gets no mercy. Peter, of course, a professor at Duke, served, uh, served repeatedly in the United States government, an expert on civil military relations, public opinion, a whole bunch of other things, and is a co-editor of a very interesting book, which I'll leave it to you to describe, Eric. But uh, Peter, I just wanted to welcome you back to the show. It's good to be back. Thank you, Eric. Peter, I really appreciate that you're a pinch hitter because, as our listeners know, we were meant to have uh, one of your co-editors of this book, um, Handoff, The Foreign Policy George W. Bush Passed to Barack Obama, which you and Megan O'Sullivan and another former guest on, on uh, Shield of the Republic, Willem Bowden, uh, have co-edited. Megan was going to join us. She is ill, but we will have her back at a later date to talk about the new geopolitics of energy. But thank you for pinch hitting at the very, very last minute or coming in out of the bullpen at the very, very last minute. Uh, I won't use any basketball analogies because Duke is still recovering from, you know, an early out, uh, you know, in the tournament this year. So tell us about the book, Peter. How did it come to be? It's an unusual enterprise. I, I should say, in full disclosure to the audience, I'm, I'm somewhat, you know, complicit in this. I was one of the reviewers of one of the memoranda uh, that was selected for publication in this book. Well, this is the book is something of a labor of love uh, by Steve Hadley and a labor of love for Steve Hadley. Uh, once you've been a staffer, you're always a staffer. What he did was he went back to the uh, Bush Library and reread all the memos that he had had the NSC prepare in preparation for handing over control of the government to whoever was going to win in 2008. Uh, and he started this uh, uh, project under President Bush's and Josh Bolton's direction early in 2008, well before it was known that it was going to be President Obama. Uh, what they did know was whoever was going to come in was running against President Bush. So there was a strong critique of Bush foreign policy from uh, Senator McCain and an even stronger critique from Senator Obama. Uh, and both were, whoever of those was going to win in 2008 was going to take over two wars and a very complex uh, geopolitical situation. And so President Bush, Josh Bolton, uh, Steve Hadley wanted to prepare that team as best they could. Uh, and so uh, Hadley had the Strategic Planning Office of the NSC coordinate a a uh, memo writing exercise where each of the directors was assigned to review the Bush policy. What was the situation we found when we came in in 2001? 
what was our strategy for dealing with it, what was the situation we were handing off to our um, successors in 2009. And alongside that would be uh, a folder filled with sort of primary source documents that they would need, memorandum of conversation, uh, presidential phone calls, uh, agreements, sidebars, all the things that uh, give texture to an overall strategy, much of which would not necessarily be knowable from the outside. So whoever was going to come in were experts in their areas, but they might not be privy to all of the, the deals, all of the promises, all of the um, understandings, if you will. And so the idea was we'll hand all of this off uh, over at uh, to the new team, and th this was a thick binder full of memos. Peter, I did want to interrupt you for one second just to draw attention for our listeners that much of the material you're talking about that would have been added to these memos in appendices, the presidential memcons, phone calls, exchanges of letters, etc., would not be, it, not only were they not knowable to those outside of the government because they were classified, but they wouldn't be readily available to the new team coming in because tr t typically, uh, you know, if you want to see the flow, literal flow of power in Washington, you know, uh, during a change of presidential administrations, you go January 20th to as close to West Executive Avenue as you can get and you'll see 18 wheelers loading up with all the documents and they pull out of there, you know, on the 19th and 20th as all the files are being taken off to the National Archives and the new team comes in essentially to empty file cabinets and dig, digging up these records is, is really difficult. By the way, this is always something I have found completely incomprehensible. I mean, it's the United States government deciding to give itself a frontal lobotomy every four to eight years and... Uh, you, you know, particularly in a da dangerous period of time, the idea that people walk into what are essentially empty desks is crazy. But that's that's another matter. What, one thing I I did want to ask. So this is um, this book. It it is unique. I've never seen anything like it. It's about the Bush administration. We're going to be talking about the Bush administration. I I do think, out of fairness to our listeners, we should all fess up about our roles in the Bush administration, because, uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, we're the, the, the shield of the Republic being what it is, it'll be tough and intellectually honest, but let's face it, we were all part of it. I'll start off since I was the most um, marginal member of the Bush administration. I served on the uh, Defense Policy Board, which is an advisory board in the Pentagon, until uh, Secretary Rice asked me to become counselor of the Department of State, which is an interesting kind of position, which I did for the last two years of the Bush administration. I think it's fair to say that I was frequently a member of the loyal oppositions, uh, whether it was about Iraq or anything else. And in a way, that was my very interesting job as counselor. So that's, that's my Bush administration story. Eric, why don't you tell them yours and then Peter should tell his. Yeah, well, I served to, uh, throughout the Bush administration in three different positions. First, as the Deputy National Security Advisor to Vice President Cheney from 2001 to three. at which point I went off to be the U.S. Ambassador to Turkey from 2003 to five, and then uh, came back uh, to be the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, the third-ranking policy position in the Pentagon, and as a sub cabinet member, worked closely with you as the counselor and with Peter as the director of strategic planning for the National Security Council. Peter, fess up. Yeah, and fess I uh, flubbed my uh, job interview at the in the first administration. <laughs> so in, in 2000, 2001, I, I got, uh, didn't do well in my interview and so didn't get an, any jobs in the first term. Uh, and I did better in the second term with my job interview, and, and Steve Hadley hired me to stand up the strategic planning cell in the on the NSC staff, which I ran from 2005 to 2007 with Will Inboden, another good friend of the show. And it was this office, the strategic planning office, that then uh, eventually was tasked with creating the transition book that uh, became this uh, the book that we're talking about. 
And just to round it out, Megan O'Sullivan was basically running the Iraq and Afghanistan portfolio on the NSC until, when did she leave the NSC staff round? Late 2007. Yeah. So um, so all of us had this look. I think Eric and I were actually physically there for the transition, which left me some, me personally, some strong views. But, uh, you know, so you've, you've got at least, you've got the three of us here with a, a certain amount of knowledge of it. Can I, I let me, if I could begin, um, and I think, you know, Eric, you've experienced transitions on both sides. Um, let me just say, I, I think the value of the book is that it does give a very good picture of the White House official mind, if you were, of how it assessed uh, its own foreign policy, how it assessed uh, the world that it inherited, and, you know, the best case going forward, although some parts of the, uh, some of the memos are moderately self-critical, I would say. The the two things that I found, uh, that, that I, th you know, I would say to a reader of this is, A, remember, these are the transition memos from the White House, not from the departments. And, uh, you know, the, the, the any, any regional policy as seen from the White House might not be the same way that regional policy was seen from the Department of State, and I dare say the same thing about defense policy. But uh, I, I have a somewhat jaundiced view of the efficacy of this. That doesn't diminish the importance of it. Because I, you know, I vividly remember my own transition, the State Department transition experience. They talked to the career people, the political people. They interviewed at the end as a courtesy. It was clear that the memos that we wrote flew out the window. Um, I mean, I was interviewed by two people who became very se very senior in the Obama administration. They were, you know, being polite because they had known me from before, but it was just clear that they had no interest really in what we have to say. And I think by and large, the Obama administration, when they came in, were not particularly interested in foreign policy. I think, you know, contingency planning for you know, various kinds of disasters, particularly immediately after inauguration, they were. But but I don't think these memos had any impact whatsoever, or, or I shouldn't say that, had very little impact on the foreign policy decision making of the Obama administration. That's my take. I think that's uh, not totally unfair. I do think that the seriousness of the effort that went into it, of which the, the memos were a part, but only just a part, did have a profound impact. Uh, you mentioned the contingency planning. Uh, there was numerous efforts to do tabletop exercises to prepare the team so that on day one, at minute one, they would know what the U.S. government could do, what capabilities it had, which were much more extensive in 2009 than they had been in January 2001, the last time this team, you know, had uh, had the reins of power. And so they very much appreciated that. There also was an effort to ensure that the wars themselves would be managed uh, with as minimum uh, disruption as possible. It's de it had been decades since a war had been handed off whilst the shooting was still going on. You have to go back to 69, really, to have uh, that kind of challenge. And that that's a difficult to change commanders in midstream, that's a, that, that could be difficult. There was, um, I think, a good effort between the, the two of them, uh, the two administrations, a good faith effort to, to minimize those. And then, while it's not the focus of the, the book, remember, they were also managing a serious financial crisis, as serious a financial crisis as we had faced since the Great Depression. Yeah. And so, and that, there was tremendous coordination between the two yeah. economic teams. So I act in, in hindsight now, people see this as the high water mark. And there's two points of uh, evidence of this. One is much of what the Bush administration did voluntarily has been codified in law as now everybody has to do it, best practice. And second of all, when it became time for President Obama to hand over in 2016, 17, they tried to recreate this process to the best of their ability. So could I, I just come back on, on that one bit and then uh, Eric, I'm sure you've got better informed uh, views. I, I will take all that, although I think the critical thing for continuity in the wars is that first you had Bob Gates as Secretary of Defense in both administrations. 
you obviously had the same uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and probably most importantly, you had Doug Lute, who was the deputy national security advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan. So, But it is no accident, memo. comrade, right? I mean, this was yeah. all part well, of the, well, but I, the, I, the point yeah. is, I don't think it has anything to do with the memos. And I think <laughs> the Ob- Ob- no, no, no. Ob- no. Ob- it, I'm not crediting think, the memos. I'm yeah. crediting... The seriousness of the effort that President Bush took I, and, and, and with I, the transition. I, I, don't, I don't dispute the seriousness of the effort. I, I think you're absolutely right, by the way, on the financial crisis. But I, I also think, you know, there's a, um, and I saw this, I thought, uh, what, what's the Latin, uh, apologia uh, pro vita sua, where, you know, you're trying to explain this is why I did what I, who I am and why right. I am what I am. You know, you're, you're I think at the end of administration, you know, you're even as you're getting kicked in the teeth every right. day in the press, you know, you're looking at the distant horizons where history with a capital H looms. So in a certain way, you know, you're not writing for Ben Rhodes, who thinks you're all a bunch of jerks. Uh, you know, you're writing for eternity. This is what makes the book so extraordinary. Right. And and that is the memos themselves would not have been declassified for another 10, 15 years, if ever. Right. It was extraordinary to get them declassified on an accelerated basis. And then the, the rest of the book is asking the same teams, to the extent that they could be reconstituted, to write a reflection postscript based on what's happened in the intervening 12 years. Now, how does, how does our, the scorecard we gave ourselves in 2009, how does that look 12 years on? Eric, you outrank us, so you should comment. Uh, so let me make a few observations about transitions in general. So uh, speaking now as a 30-year career public servant who went through the transition in 1981, 1989, 1993, 2001, and then the 2008-2009 transition. So my former Foreign Service colleague, Avis Bolin, who's the daughter of Chip Bolin, the famous Russia hand in the State Department, used to have a, a kind of bon mot about the career Foreign Service view of transitions, which was no matter how much you hated the last bunch of political appointees, the new group inevitably makes you have nostalgia for the last one. And my own observation of you know transitions is every four, eight years, as you said, Elliot, the, you know, the outgoing team really by and large in good faith, tries to prepare the incoming team by telling them, look, this is not something that's partisan that we're giving you. We've learned through a school of hard knocks how tough these issues are. They're all tough issues, you know, um, and here's what we've learned. We really don't want you to have to, you know, make mistakes, you know, step on rakes because we haven't warned you. And, and, you know, this is our prize pig and we hope you really love it, you know, and, and we hand off, you know, something that looks like this doorstop that Peter and colleagues were involved in preparing and that you and I were involved in preparing and, you know, in our different agencies as well. And the incoming team looks at it and says, yeah, it's a pig and, you know, throws it in the, in the trash. But very soon thereafter, the incoming team starts to bump up against the realities and their, and their first reaction is to say, oh my God, you know, the last guys were so stupid and we're so smart, we just got elected. So obviously we're really smart. And the last guy screwed it up so badly that it's going to take us at least a year to dig out of this mess that they've created for us. Nobody else before us has ever gotten the same steaming plate of crap that, you know, our, you know, our predecessors have bequeathed us. And then in the second year, they're basically saying, it was even worse than we thought. It's so bad. It's going to take us four years to dig out, maybe eight to dig out from this mess, which is why we deserve to be reelected, because we have to dig out from this. And then, you know, rinse, rosh, and, and repeat. I mean, it's, it's a very repetitive and predictable cycle, I think. I do think that the Bush administration, and I think most people in the Obama administration would, you know, admit that made a really good faith effort because of what Peter was saying. This was the first, you know, handoff in 40 years in the midst of a war. And we had the, uh, we already had the Presidential Transition Act, which had been put in place some new ability to handle this kind of uh, transition 
you know, in a thorough way. And as Peter points out, it's now been amended several times to incorporate some of what uh, went on in the Bush administration. And having been very deeply involved in the Romney transition, uh, I can tell you that we were, you know, we definitely were beneficiaries of what the Bush people had done in terms of thinking about, you know, about transition. But having said that, you know, I do think uh, you know, there's just an inevitable degree of self-justification that goes on in these memos. It's impossible not to do it because you're trying to explain how you got to where uh, you are. And, you know, everybody collectively at some level is implicated in all of these decisions that were involved. I think it's worth focusing on maybe a couple of specifics. I mean, part of the problem of trying to deal in a 50 minute podcast with a book like this which is 900 pages i mean the memos cover everything from you know iraq and afghanistan which of course were major sources of concern but also uh, you know pepfar and policy in africa the millennium challenge corporation and development of all sorts of things some things not covered which is also perhaps you know interesting and worth you know, commenting on, uh, for instance, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I don't recall that there's a climate change transition paper on the international side. There's a lot in here, but I think for our purposes, maybe we should focus on sort of, I would say, Iraq, Afghanistan, Russia, and China, kind of the big muscle movements. Isn't there an overarching theme, though, uh, that this is really a question to you, Peter, and also to you, Eric, and that is, the so-called freedom agenda, which has been caricatured, but I think was central, became central to George W. Bush's thinking. It's not where he started out. It's certainly not, I think, where my old boss, Condi Rice, started out. I doubt that is where Steve Hadley started out. And, you know, one of the things that did strike me about the volume is it does sort of begin with a, you know, as always, a beautifully written piece by Pete Weiner and, alas, uh, the late Mike Gerson, on this subject. So is that, you know, as, as the three of us think through the, uh, the foreign policy of the administration we're part of, is that an overarching theme? Or can we de- decompose it into Afghanistan, Iraq, China, Russia, war on terror? So I would say two things. One is that the, the book in its uh, massiveness, <laughs> comprehensiveness, is itself a corrective to one of the caricatures, uh, caricatured critiques of the Bush administration, namely that Bush was only all about Iraq, Afghanistan, global war on terror, and that's it. Uh, there's nothing else to the Bush administration. They, they, they didn't try to do anything else. They didn't do anything else. They couldn't do anything else because they were 100% myopically focused on Afghanistan and Iraq. And that's just flatly false. It's ahistorical. And the, the book documents in, in somewhat numbing detail all of the lines of action, all of the other uh, things that the administration was trying, some of which worked, some of it didn't work. The second thing is, and, and this puts, you put your finger on it, that over time there was a logic that was guiding uh, the administration. It wasn't a procrustean bed type of logic where they tried to squeeze everything into uh, the the freedom agenda rubric, but that there was certain logical claims that the president had about how the world works, about what the direction of uh, U.S. interests uh, were, and where where U.S. would find more reliable allies, and where they wouldn't, and that this logic, uh, which can be summarized in the freedom agenda. Uh, shows up in other places besides just Iraq and Afghanistan. And at the risk of triggering uh, Elliot I, in an earlier debate we had, you can find some of this logic in the national security strategy, which uh, particularly the 2006 version of it, which lays out the, the ways in which the freedom agenda might apply to, say, development aid or global, how you deal with global, the problems of globalization uh, or uh, other regions. But again, it's pushing back on a caricature because the caricature of Bush is 
that the freedom agenda means invading other countries and trying to force them to have elections at gunpoint, which of course is would be a stupid policy if that was uh, what was attempted. It wasn't, in, in fact, what the administration attempted. But you know, it's Peter, also the Peter case, Le it would be stupid to say that we are indifferent as to whether uh, we're dealing with a dictator or whether we're dealing with a democracy. We treat them all the same. That, that also would not be a, a sound policy. I just want to pull on that thread a little bit. Because one of the, I think, really very positive qualities of this volume is not only is it an apologia pro sua vita, as you know, Elliot was suggesting, but there are critical essays appended both by the participants looking backwards to, you know, kind of grade themselves a little bit, but also independent scholars like Martha Kumar and, and our friend uh, Mel Leffler who review this and, and have some criticisms, you know, of of their own. And I think one of Mel's criticisms here is particularly apt. I mean, he, he talks about the freedom agenda, but the truth is, I, in my view anyway, the freedom agenda, you know, really was very focused on basically one, you know, part of the world, uh, essentially. I mean, maybe, maybe you could say it was also parts of the third world outside of the Middle East, you know, Africa through the Millennium Challenge Corporation and, and other mechanisms. But it's really quite striking that, you know, Russia and China were not a part in some sense of the freedom agenda, you know, if you will. So, um, no, I disagree. Uh, so let me push back if I could. That You can. The, they certainly weren't part of the caricatured version of the freedom agenda, which says we're going to topple your regime at musket point and force you to have an election. Uh, we didn't approach uh, Asia that way. But the hedging strategy with respect to China took very seriously the concept that we had some democratic partners in the region, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and crucially, India. And the perception that in the long run, India would be a better strategic partner with us, in part because of shared democratic values. That that we weren't insensitive to all the many ways in which the geopolitics are complicated, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, uh, the fact that India was a democracy was a relevant fact to the geopolitics of Asia and therefore uh, a relevant fact to how we hedged against China. So that's the first point. The second point was the Bush administration, after some debate, made the same bet that the Clinton administration made, which they made after some debate, uh, which was the same bet that Bush 41 made, and namely yeah. that over time, China, if we brought them into the international system over time, economic liberalization would lead to political li liberalization. And that bet, which of course now has come a cropper, was a open-eyed bet made at the time. And when it was Hu Jintao leading uh, China, the bet seemed to have a little bit more uh, promise to it than when it was Xi Jinping. And so it was an, and it was informed, therefore, a little bit by the freedom agenda is what I, what I would say. Now, in the end, in hindsight, uh, Xi Jinping blew that strategy up. And so we have a very different China today. And I think it's worth asking, could we have done something different in the in the eight years that Bush had with China that would have put us in a better position today vis-a-vis -vis China? I, that's a hard bet to make. Elliot, let me just uh, let me just address some of what Peter said, and then I'll be happy to kick it back over to you. Um, so, Peter, all fair points that you make, but I think there's a flip side to that where the, the freedom agenda you know, is not in evidence. And that is, and you're, you're correct that the administration made the same bet on both Russia and China that the Clinton administration did. But and I would Obama argue... Made, <laughs> and, and, and Obama and, made the and, same bet, yes. Yeah, and I would say that that, you know, in 2007, by 2007 and 8, although it was Hu Jintao and not uh, Xi Jinping yet, my view is it should have been clear already that in both of these cases, the nature of these regimes 
was going to make them very serious problems for us going forward. There were already plenty of signs of it at the time. And that I think in in this instance, I you know, I in the spirit of, you know, criticism, self criticism. Maoist self criticism? <laughs> yes. I, I would I would say that, you know, there was a huge opportunity cost to the fact that we were very focused on Iraq and Afghanistan. I certainly in the Defense Department when I was there from two thousand five to two thousand nine, that was my overriding concern because we had two hundred and twenty five thousand US soldiers, sailors, airmen and marines uh, in the CENTCOM AOR fighting two wars. And, uh, you know, it's very hard for any administration really to have much bandwidth left after that. I'm not saying we didn't do all these things that you are talking about and that are reflected in this, but I think we missed a bet, um, you know, on, on Russia and China. There was an opportunity cost to the focus uh, that we had on, on the 9-11 wars. And I, I, I think it's a mistake to just sort of whistle past the graveyard about that. So I, if I could uh, just pile on that, you know, with regard to uh, the idea that our relationship with Japan and Australia and India is part of the freedom agenda, I, I don't really buy that. I mean, it, seems, it is, you know, as in ways you just pointed out, Peter, it's a result of continuity of American foreign policy from Clinton. And, and the truth is, you know, we don't like to admit it. There's actually a lot of continuity in American foreign policy which makes one, again, kind of doubt the significance of all these memoranda. There's a, there's a logic there. Uh, you know, could we put ourselves in a better position vis-a-vis -vis China? I, I think one of the big mistakes, and here, you know, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the freedom agenda, uh, don't get me wrong, but, you know, one of the mistakes so that, I. I, that, that I think gets made is to assume that we can really in very important ways, affect the internal dynamics of uh, societies like China or Russia. And I think one of the things that we're learning is, whether it's China or Russia, actually, there was no way that we could really turn those in a more liberal direction. There were very powerful internal dynamics which were pushing in the other opposite direction. So what was incumbent upon us was to try to contain that, block it, subvert it. Uh, but, but I think a mistake to think that we could we could really change that. And, and I, I do think that that is somehow connected with some of the irrational optimism in some parts of the government, not all of it, about what we were actually achieving in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, I, as counselor, my job was chiefly to walk into the secretary's office and say, I know you think that things are going reasonably well. My job is to tell you, I've been looking at the evidence, and it's and it's not, and so I do think that there was a certain degree of intoxication with this, and there was never really, particularly on Iraq and Afghanistan, one of my critiques of how we, and I say we because I was part of the administration too, of of how we approach is we never really set ourselves okay. What's a reasonable set of expectations for a place like Iraq or Afghanistan? I mean, we know that we're not going to turn them into Sweden, you know. Should we be satisfied with a not excessively thuggish dictatorship? And instead, I think we, we never really went through that setting of the, you know, a, a reasonable target. And then the last thing I want to do is really just, uh, I think, Eric, your point needs to be made even more strongly because a large part of foreign policy is words and words are very important. And, you know, in that sense, memos are important. But the main thing is those wars really prevented us from putting the money into defense modernization that we really needed to. And it was a, it was, they were a major uh, distraction in some way, but they, that have really put us quite in a, quite a challenging position vis-a-vis -vis China, it, particularly if we had recognized the challenge that they were going to pose. And I have to say, rereading the, the Russia memo was a bit better than the China memo, but I think neither of them really saw coming at us the challenge that those two states were going to pose. I mean, there's concern. There had to be concern because of uh, things like Georgia, but, you know, there, there wasn't a whole lot of foresight. Now, you know, is that on Bush? No, it's even much more on Obama, I would say. But I, I think that's the fact of the matter. And we are paying for some of the misallocation of resources that happened during the administration we were part of.
So I understand the critique, and I think some of it is is fair, but not all of it. Uh, the what is a fair critique is to say because not the Bin Laden attacked us on nine eleven, that created a urgent near term threat that the administration had to deal with, and that it could not not deal with that. It couldn't say, you know what? To be sure. This is not a big problem. We're going to just yeah. focus on... But nobody's saying that, Peter. Okay. So, but it required a, a serious response, and that response was OEF. Uh, and we can have a debate at the, the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, and we can have a debate about, well, was there a better outcome that was possible in Afghanistan if we had say, resourced it more heavily in 2002 and 2003. So is the counterfactual that you're arguing that the uh, Afghanistan was winnable, but it was only winnable if we made different choices in 2002, 2003. Uh, for, my, for my money, the, the hinge, the turning point in Afghanistan was in 2006 when Musharraf cut the deal with, uh, with the tribes. And that's when Afghanistan went from a manageable problem into a much more uh, serious uh, problem because, of course, the tribes didn't honor their agreement. They lifted up pressure on the Taliban, and that the Taliban was able to reconstitute as a regime-threatening uh, problem. The SIGAR lists all sorts of other problems that went wrong in Afghanistan, but but really, you're either saying Afghanistan was never winnable, okay, then what were you going to do on in October 2001? Or you're saying it was winnable, but it needed to have been won before Musharraf makes this deal. And I, I haven't heard a, a an argument that, uh, you know, is compelling to me about how we could have won it differently. So that's Afghanistan. Now, Iraq is a different problem because, of course, the war in hindsight was a mistake because the intelligence predicate for it turned out to be flawed. Um, would the world would it the world have been a perfect um, Eden if we hadn't invaded Af Af Iraq in two thousand three? I don't think so. People are forgetting what we would have could have known and could have not known. Right? We now know that if we had not invaded. Iraq in 2003, Saddam Hussein would have done all the things that we thought he had already done, but he was delaying that until after he got out from underneath the sanctions. So the description of the Iraq threat, which was not accurate in 2002, would have become accurate by 2004, 2005, uh, if we had not invaded. And so you would have that problem, which was a decade old problem managing uh, threatening a crucial uh, portion of of the globe, namely uh, the Middle East and the um, relevance of the Middle East for energy security. So I think we still would have had a big problem that would have diverted the United States, but it wouldn't have been as big a problem as the one we actually had because we invaded and then found out he didn't have the WMD that was expected and, and more crucially, the... Um, early years of the war were, of phase four, were not handled uh, optimally. And so the war was in danger of being lost in 2006. So it's a more complicated assessment is what I'm saying. So, so I, you know, for my sins, I spent most of my time in state working on Afghanistan uh, and including going there into Pakistan a lot. And the conclusion I came to was the problem wasn't Musharraf in 2006. The problem was Pakistan. And there was no way that the Pakistanis were ever going to let us stabilize an Afghan regime that was not under their control. I mean, that makes it vir virtually, you know, undoable. Uh, and perhaps that was the case. I, you know, the part of the problem, I think, but with both wars, you know, I, you can make the case for both of them. And I did. And I, I, and I take your logic. The execution was really pretty poor in both cases. And that's something to reflect on. And again, that's that part of foreign policy, which is not in memos. It's in people and organizations and equipment and, and actual action. I'd like to actually further that point, which is 
there's been a lot of focus on the civilian side of this. You know, the things that got you know uh, got done wrong in terms of various. I mean, there's you know I've got, I'm looking at my bookshelf and there's literally two two shelves full of books on Iraq and Afghanistan and the mistakes of policy that were made. I don't think there's been enough serious uh, introspection on the part of the military about the military contribution to this. Um, I completely agree. Um, you know, to Peter's point about, you know, phase four not having been adequately done, that's because the CENTCOM commander flat out refused to, uh, to plan for phase four. Uh, and that's, you know, that's clear from the two volume history of the U.S. Uh, US Army in Iraq. And that was his responsibility you know, and just didn't do it. So, I mean, that's just one example among many uh, that, you know, could be offered. And I think that's an important thing going forward. There really has to be a, some a much more, I think that's a task for scholars, frankly, uh, to, you know, do a kind of no holds barred uh, review of how the military actually performed in these uh, two wars. There was a lot of heroism. I don't mean to you know, minimize the uh, sacrifices that individual families and, and soldiers made. But there also were some, you know, very serious, I think, command failures, uh, which I don't think have gotten adequate attention. Uh, and I don't disagree with what Peter said about, you know, the decisions with regard to Iraq and Afghanistan um, at all. But I do think there's an element here of, you know, attention diverted, there's also, though, an element of the Russia and China problems are are manageable, even though I think they were starting to head, certainly by the last two years of the Bush administration, in in directions that indicated they were going to become a lot more problematic. I, in, in other words, some of what we start to see, for instance, in Chinese behavior in the um, in Southeast Asia, in the in the you know South China Sea, for instance, starts to emerge in 2010. That's you know close enough in time to the end of the Bush administration that you can't say, well, that, you know, that was unknowable in 2008. And there clearly were already signs, uh, the Chinese doing stuff that was going to be a problem for us in terms of their military buildup, in terms of their attitudes. I'll give you one example. President Bush asked Hu Jintao when they met, I can't remember now, Peter, you'll remember better. It was like 2005 or six wanted to start a dialogue on nuclear weapons and have a dialogue between STRATCOM and the then 2nd Artillery Division, which was responsible for nuclear weapons in the Chinese system. Never happened for three years. Couldn't get it to happen. Still hasn't happened after efforts by, serious efforts by both the Obama and Trump administrations to try and get that kind of dialogue going. And now we're looking at the prospect of 1,500 you know, Chinese nuclear warheads in 2035, according to the Pentagon's China Military Power Report. That was already a trend that was discernible, you know, in 2006-07. We, we should have been more alive to that. I'm, I'm, this is really self-criticism. I, I myself think, uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, attuned enough to this in retrospect. Well, I'm happy to criticize both of you completely. Uh, and <laughs> I feel very comfortable doing that. But I, I, I would add two other dimensions, and that is that the trade dimension and climate change, and both of those play in slightly different ways than the narrative you've struck now, which is uh, because we were obsessed with Iraq, we couldn't do anything with respect to China. The Bush administration was building a trade policy, a global trade policy, that was designed to uh, hem in China is, too, is the wrong word, but it was designed to create a rules based system that would uh, pressure China into playing fairly. The problem is not competing with China. It, the problem is competing with a China that doesn't play fairly. Uh, and the or the original idea of the the uh, CTP with the um, the Asian uh, trade architecture was designed at late Bush administration and then handed off to the Obama team. And the, the expectation was they would move that down and, and get that cemented in. And then you would have an economic 
architecture that would help manage the rise of China in a more effective way than we have now without it. You could say that uh, Bush should have, should have gotten further on that in 2008 than he did, okay. But that was really squandered by the, the successor. And they were late in pushing for it. They did. Yep. They were late for trade protection authority. And, they waited till election season when it was, exactly. you know, and, de and dead on arrival. And by 2017, but, it was too late, right? By the, by the time yeah. that the administration yeah. was serious about it, it was too late. The great thing about that is in 2016, we had three candidates running for president all running against it. Exactly, right? including, Hil including the Secretary of State who had helped. Uh, yeah, uh, Hillary, uh, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, and, and Donald Trump. Yeah, but the, the second thing, and this uh, I have more sympathy for the Obama team on, but it complicates the picture enormously, and that is climate change. They had a theory of the case that climate change was an existential threat to the United States, and you cannot have a game-changing approach to climate change in 2009 without engaging China. You just can't. Uh, and so they had to, They Obama had a strategy that said, we have to engage with China, cooperate with China. And so it was a, it was not a confrontation, confront China. It was an engaged China. In fact, they were flirting with the G2 idea of, you know, a condominium of these two great. But, but I, th I think that, I think that was naivete, Peter. I, I mean, I, yes, it was, it was necessary you, for I'm climate change. That's not on Bush, right? That, that the point is, no, no, it, it, it's not on Bush, but, 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 that would have done that. Yeah, but that. here is, here is what is, I think, on the administration we were part of. I, you know, I think it's not so much that they, the people were so, well, people were very busy with Iraq and Afghanistan. And I vividly remember, as I'm sure Eric does, going to all those uh, meetings of the principals and occasionally NSC meetings, you could just see people were completely exhausted and drained by, F by Iraq and Afghanistan and just the desire and knowing that they were deeply unpopular, just wanting to get out with their skin intact. But, but I think there's another element, which is, and, and in this way, I do think the way the freedom agenda was framed distorted things. So was it in the second inaugural that President Bush talked about ending tyranny as an objective, which, forgive me, that was Looney Tunes. In fact, I think I said that at a private meeting that you you invited me to, Peter. Uh, I think John Gaddis came up with that phrase, actually. John, John Gaddis came up to it, and with all due respect to John Gaddis as a formidable historian, it's Looney Tunes. And I, I was dismayed that it, it got into the president's speech. But the point is, if you're if you're framing things in that way, it's very hard, I think, to then say the problem is we've got two big powers here, one really big, one still kind of big, and with lots of nuclear weapons, which are revisionist, which are hostile, which are you know developing their militaries very very quickly, which are not going to be amenable to kind words or you know playing by our by the rules of the international system as we conceive them. And we need to be ready to deal with that in a somewhat rail, not entirely rail politic way, but in a somewhat rail politic way. So I, you know, in that respect, I do think um, the Bush administration made a mistake. Now, the last thing I'll just say on this, because I see we're, we're really pretty close to the end. You know, there, there's an interesting issue, I think, for all of us, for anybody who's been in the administration, you know, what, what blame do you take for what happened or what responsibility, I should say, or accountability do you take for what happened on your watch and how much, you know, is really depends on the, the people who took the next watch and what, you know, what, is it, what are the things we should feel badly about? What are the things the Obama people should feel badly about? But I, I do think this is one where the framing that the Bush administration used blinded them somewhat to something that you could see coming around the corner. And that was really pronounced under the Obama administration, which particularly with regard to Russia, but with regard to China too, just did not want to see this coming. Well, my homework assignment is to read a chapter, ask you to read chapter two of the 2006 NSS, where that phrase ending tyranny is defined. 
uh, and it's not quite as grandiose uh, in its. How could it be anything other than grandiose, uh, read chapter Peter? Chapter two, and we'll we can reconfirm. Uh, no, no. If you can't, if you can't explain it in two syllable so, words to our listeners, forget about it. Uh, this is where, if you had Will Limboden uh, here, you would you would get it. It it's not ending all uh, abuses of human rights around the world in our time. It's ending a particular form of government. Not all autocrats are tyrants. It's a particular form of, of autocracy. So, so is, think, is Putin, Singapore is, is, is not an, is not a tyranny. Okay. Uh, is Putin, a, is Putin a tyrant? In 2008? Probably not. In 2000. Oh yeah, in 2008, 2008 he certainly was. Brad, and in 2001, almost certainly not. Right. So he, this is one of the big things that I think it, uh, historical perspective it, brings to bear, which is to recognize that the Putin we're dealing with today in 2023 is in one sense, the the same human being. I don't subscribe to the conspiracy theories that say there's four Putins and they swap them in and out body doubles. In one sense, he's the same Putin. In another sense, though, he has evolved into the worst form of himself. And, this, and his policies in 2023 are not the policies that Bush administration were facing in 2001. It just wasn't. Well, I don't know. I mean, in by 2007 in the Munich speech. Okay, uh, but and, that's 2007, not 2001. And by 2000, and yes. by 2008, the the invasion of Georgia. I mean, I think right. the writing was pretty clearly on the wall. Absolutely, and and the Bush and Bush approach to Putin evolved over those eight years. I mean, I, that the memo makes clear, right? That they, there was an attempt at a reset in 2001 um, and uh, and it was working for a while. P Putin was one of the best allies in the early year or two of the war on terror, shared a lot on intelligence, as you know, uh, particularly with respect to Afghanistan. And so there, but by 2007, actually, I would say too earlier with the um, color revolutions of 2005, which is when you begin to see Putin uh, shifting because yeah, he, begins, absolutely. he perceives any fl flowering of democracy on his near abroad as a threat to his regime survival. And so Correct. he becomes he becomes closer to a tyrant by 2007, 2008. Yeah, but look, I mean, there, 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 there's John McCain, the late beloved John McCain's famous line. You know, President Bush says he looked into the guy's soul, and right. McCain says, "Yeah, I looked into his soul, and I saw the letters KGB." Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I think, I think an unillusioned observer would have said that, not to criticize right. President but by the Bush. Time, but, but the but the Bush administration's policy on Russia in 2008 was very different from the Bush administration policy in 2001. Well, we, we, had, we, had, we, had, we had to react to the uh, invasion exactly. of Georgia, though even there we were cautious. But my, my point is our framing of the world, as I recall it, at least in 2008, was not a, a world in which there's going to be contests with great powers that would be very difficult for us to influence in, internally. Um, and it was, it was, I'm sorry, there's just no way you can turn the language ending tyranny into you know, kind of a reasonable view of what you can do in foreign policy. I'll, I'll let Eric adjudicate this no, one. I, I'm not going to try and adjudicate, uh, you know, between former pupil and student, I mean, and teacher. I mean, that's that's not my, my <laughs> job here on Shield of the Republic. But I, I we are going to have to bring this to an end. I, I would just point out to our listeners that we have spent almost an hour vigorously discussing maybe 80 pages out of this 900-page <laughs> tome uh, in terms of the material. Maybe it's 100 pages out of 900. But I do think this is a very rich uh, historical resource. Uh, it's a real achievement. I, I really take my hat off, Peter, to you, uh, Will, and Megan for uh, doing all this. And for Steve Hadley having you know undertaken uh, this project, which I do think serves the greater good we will uh, undoubtedly uh, have you back, Peter, to you know talk about all sorts of things. There are a lot of a uh, lot of civil military relations questions that I really want to ask you about, including a very uh, interesting recent uh, article uh, in which you appear prominently. I think it was in Politico uh, about the remaking of of Mark Milley, the chairman mm -hmm. of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
Well, if Elliot Cohen will allow me back on, I would love to. Come oh back. yeah, he'll allow you back on. <laughs> you know, to to that, and this will be my swan song today, Peter. As always, you're uh, wonderfully good humored. I, you know, I I will say it is very difficult. I think for many members of the uh, of the Bush administration, particularly with all the trauma associated with Iraq, to kind of sit down and have a candid conversation about you know. Where did we do the right thing and was misunderstood? Where did we do the wrong thing? Um, in fact, I, I think you may have been present at um, an event we had. This was during the, uh, uh, I guess, the 2012 campaign, where you know I, <laughs> I tried after dinner to get a uh, Chinese self-criticism session going, and we just had to call it off after 15 minutes because people's, you know, the veins were bulging in people's uh, necks and foreheads. Uh, and voices were getting raised. So I, you know, I do very much appreciate, you know, the ability to have a civil conversation about it, because I think, you know, the, the thing about the, the thing about it, and I, th I do think this is something that listeners should be aware of, you know, you, you can't read these memos, and Mel Leffler makes this point, and think these are, that, that these are anything other than highly intelligent, public-spirited, thoughtful people wrestling with an, a very, very difficult and in many ways intractable uh, world. And it's the nature of being involved, particularly in things like wars, that you know, people get very passionate. Uh, but it's also very important to be able to have a, a candid conversation about that. So I, I want to thank you, Peter, and you, Eric, for that. And, and I do think the book is a contribution to that, too. Well, thank you. And I'll just say that I do think I encourage folks to get the book and dip into it, whatever chapter is of interest to them. I think they'll see that the postscripts are fairly candid in calling balls and strikes in hindsight where we see them. Uh, we don't pull punches in evaluating our successors, both Democrat and Republican. So there's some critiques of uh, President Trump's administration in the postscripts as well. But uh, I don't think you come away with this thinking that this is pure propaganda. I think these are, uh, as you said, Elliot, serious people wrestling with serious problems. And it's striking how much continuity eat across very different presidents you see on so many of these issues. That's because when fair-minded people are wrestling with what to do, they end up sort of homing in on a, on a handful of uh, courses of action. They try one. If that doesn't work, they try the next one. And uh, I think we are grateful, or we as a country should be grateful uh, that there are folks taking it that seriously. And I hope folks who read the book will agree with that. Well, Peter, I look, I agree with that. Um, I, I think um, I've thought for some time that it would be difficult to get a you know, a fair assessment of the Bush administration historically f for two reasons. One, because the war wars in Iraq and to a lesser degree Afghanistan were so controversial, but also because of the circumstances in which the Bush administration came in. The um, disputed election in 2000, the Supreme Court case, the fact that Bush was a minority president who actually lost the popular vote by 500,000 votes. I think there were a lot of people who felt he was an illegitimate president. Um, and uh, as a result, you know, everything that he and Vice President Cheney and the rest of the administration did were, you know, the, the work of the devil. I do think this book, I think um, um, Mel Leffler's essay in this book, and I think Mel's book on confronting Saddam are the beginning of, I think, what I would call serious historical reflection, you know, on that period. This book is a tremendous contribution to that. And I would just say one, you know, thing that I think doesn't get remarked on enough, which is for those of us who, you know, lived through the 9-11 experience and uh, I was in government at the time, I was in the White House when it happened. If, you know, you had told me then that we would go through the next eight years without another mass casualty attack in the United States. I would have said that's highly unlikely. Um, and I think that is, you know, without a doubt, an important uh, achievement that the Bush administration had. It was, I think, the primary driver for President Bush uh, for the rest of his seven years in office. I think that was appropriate. I think it serves us well to think about what may be um, opportunity costs there were for that single-minded focus that we had. That's pretty much what we've been discussing today. 
but I, I really think you and your colleagues have done the nation a service by, by putting this book together. So thank you for joining us, Peter. Thanks for having me.